Now, 2023 is approaching. This means change at the top. And with it, hope that things in Nigeria will also change at the bottom and that life, the economy and governance will improve. Typically, most people want to get past the last eight years and look forward with hope to the next. It's a bit like when the new Afrobeats music came out and you go through your downloads of old songs from the 80s and 90s and you realize that you don't want to play them anymore and they no longer hold much enchantment for you. The old familiar political tunes have been heard once too often and now you want political music of a higher order. So will 2023 deliver that higher political expectation? Will it be the clincher for Nigeria? Well, my first guest today is the Nigerian human rights activist, lawyer, academic doctor and writer, Professor Chidi Odinkalu. He was the former chairman of Nigeria's National Human Rights Commission and is currently the senior team manager for the Africa program of the Open Justice Initiative. He's worked as an advisor to the Ford Foundation, the World Bank, the African Union, and the International Council for Human Rights Policy in Geneva. And Professor Chidi Odinkalu joins me now in the studio. Absolutely delighted to have you here. Same here, Charles. So it's always Same a bit of a pleasure. challenge to extricate you from the so many things that you do. Really? So we appreciate very much having you here. Oh, you're much too kind. <laughs> very generous. Is, is there a choice here for Nigerians to either go the way of division and tribalism and meanness or follow the other part that unites the country in solving big problems and rebuilding the country, giving more people a better life? Is there a choice or it doesn't work that way in Nigeria? Does it really work that way? I, I, I like to think that if you give Nigerian citizens choice, nobody would want to be where we are now, which is basically a democratization of nihilism um, and a democratization of death. Uh, not I love that to, term to and the way that you used it. Because that's really what it is. Mm. And, and no Nigerian would want to be here, north to south, east, west, south, south, north, central. Nobody wants to be here. And it, it seems to me the bigger choice is where do our leaders, our rulers, however you want to describe them, want to take the country? Do they want to take us down the path of division or do they want to take us up the path of prosperity, um, of a different kind of country? I, mean, I don't know, if, if, you, if you look at the ranking of Africa's con African countries by economic growth, Nigeria is number 44. Um, That's pretty worrying, isn't it? 44 out of 54. Uh, and uh, basically, we are in, in the last 10. Ethiopia is no longer ranked because the war has tanked the economy. If you added Ethiopia, that's 44 out of 55. And 44 out of 55. That is a terrible place to be in. When you understand that seven, eight years ago, Nigeria was actually the to in the top two of economic growth on the continent. In West Africa, we are about the 13th or thereabouts out of 15 countries. Uh, but it's, it's actually not the economic numbers. It's the intangibles that hold people together where we are bleeding everything. The economy of the Northwest is destroyed. The economy of the Southeast is destroyed. The economy of the Middle Belt is destroyed. And the economy of the Northeast does not exist. So where do you have the outposts of productivity that can fire up an economy? And that really is what the challenge is here. Without an uh, you look at the Southeast, everybody is supposed to be in sit-at-home mode. Mm. Last week, you had Tuesday was the, uh, Tuesday was the Eid, public holiday. Mm. Wednesday was NSA's anniversary, sit-at-home. Thursday was Namdekano's trial, you sit at home. And then Friday is there, you're in weekend mode. Where is the productivity and where are people going to find food to eat? Well, let me take you up on that um, particular problem in the southeast at the moment, which, which appears to be the, ones that, that the one that's getting a lot of headlines because obviously the others, people are fairly used to them. We all agree that there has to be a silencing of the guns in the southeast for things to go forward 
on both sides. I mean, I know you've just come from, from the southeast, and that's why I think this is particularly relevant because you've been there and you've kind of felt the pulse of that region. Is there any sign of the silencing of the guns that perhaps the government, either state or federal, and an IPOB may be talking at some level or preparing to talk in the near future? At cross purposes, maybe, um, if any dialoguing is going on. Um, my sense is, uh, first of all, IPOB, uh, the IPOB's command and control structure, if it existed, is broken down. So there, is, there isn't one IPOB. There are multiple IPOBs. That's a big problem. Um, and you've got political IPOBs. Uh, in Anambra State, for instance, um, I think one of the challenges with the election is knowing which IPOB you're talking about. There are political IPOBs owned by partisan political actors in the elections in Anambra State. You've got um, the cults of Anambra Central, um, who are also a faction of IPOB. Uh, uh, I'm masquerading that is as a faction of IPOB. You have got cults that are from outside the state, and so you've got a set of cults that are from somewhere in a Bonyi state and parts of Abia state as part of the political IPOB in Anambra state, for instance. And then you've got the Namdekanos IPOB. And all of them are competing for space. And there is a bit of commercial dimension to this because people are making money off of this stuff. And there are other benefits uh, that could accrue, inclu including who gets to be declared in the Anambra state election. So it's totally messed up. Uh, th that's the truth. Uh, but the reality is also that there is incapacity of leadership, both from the federal level and from the political elite of the Southeast. And I think we've got to admit that part of the challenge is the complete dissoluteness hmm. of the political elite of the Southeast. That's a very good point, um, and, and, and that term, dissolute. And, and in the pecking order of the security challenges that the Nigerian government is dealing with or is seeking to deal with, how big is the issue of separatism and IPOB in the Southeast? Does it, in the Southeast, does it loom larger than most in Nigeria at the present time. Th there isn't one separatism in the Southeast. There are se in Nigeria, there are separatisms. Mm. Um, I think the challenge, a fundamental part of the challenge, in, in my view, uh, I'm always entitled to be wrong, is that President Buhari, sadly, with uh, aided and abetted by the Attorney General of the Federation, Abu Bakar Malami, has chosen some separatisms as tolerable and other separatisms as beyond the pale. If you remember, uh, Boko Haram declared a caliphate. That's separatism. Mm. The bandits are not exactly seeking to assert the unity of Nigeria or the supremacy of Nigeria's separatism in the south, uh, of Nigeria's sovereignty. That's in the southwest, in the northwest. Now, the people called killer herdsmen uh, who have been active in parts of the Northwest and the Middle Belt, um, occasioning a lot of destruction and killings, are not exactly models of uh, argumentation for unity either. And they are, by the way, elites of parts, in parts of northern Nigeria have argued that they are actually a bunch of outlaws and, you know, um, anti-diluvians who are beyond uh, uh, sovereignty and should be, should be accommodated as not part of our civilization. That's a separatism. You've got the Yoruba Nissan movement. That's uh, separatism. And you've got, by the way, the pirates in the Nigerian littoral in the south-south have been arguing a case for separatism since at least Adakaboro. And now add to that IPOB. Now, what is the challenge here? How do you deal with all these separatisms? You either deal with them as separatisms, or you negotiate with all of them. Mm. What's happened? Today, you hear Sheikh Gumi saying that if the bandits are declared, uh, I call them terrorist bandits, but if they are declared um, as, if they are proscribed as terrorist groups, that Nigeria will not know sleep. That is the problem. So you've got the Attorney General of the Federation 
acting as a senior advocate of bandits rather than a senior advocate of Nigeria. That is troubling. So we obviously, I mean, you've identified what you consider to be the problems. As we look for solutions, do we have to come back to the fact that it's, it's about creating spaces and addressing the grievances that are at the root of the conflict, and it's about identity, one identity feeling that they're left out and the other having control, and that is, of course, part of a legacy that dates back to colonial times. Yes, there is a legacy that dates back to colonial times. But look, we got amalgamated in 1914. To 1960, that's 46 years. We've been independent for 61 years. That's 15 years, more than 46 years. And I don't think it's, I, I do appreciate the challenges of colonialism. I'm not, I've, mm. I, you know, I've read Lord Lugard's amalgamation report and, and dual mandate. So I, I'd like to hope that I understand the challenges of colonialism. And I've read history from Battle of Burmi to the, the annihilation of, uh, the, the colonial annihilations um, all, all across the country. The problem is the failure of Nigeria's post-colonial elite, in my view, and what, how to reset the country. Mm. Uh, and uh, the, the way I like to put it, we are suffering a sovereign metastasis. And it's eating us up at a rate that the normal mechanisms of control, chemo, radio, cannot help. We need a little bit of a, a miracle, but we also need a leader. The problem is that that particular technology hasn't quite been invented yet, has L it? Well, we can actually mm. get a leader who can help us assure us that they can buy us enough time for that invention to take place. So it's about yeah. leadership. I think the core of our challenge is leadership. Okay, please stay with us. We'll come back to you in a minute. You're watching the Arise interview. Plenty more still ahead as we continue our chat about the talking points of the day in Nigeria with the former chairman of the Nigerian Human Rights Commission, Professor Chidi Odinkalu. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Arise interview. I'm Charles Anyukolu. Now, you might have heard from uh, heard the former U.S. President Barack Obama speaking at the weekend, saying America is at a turning point and needs to reject the politics of meanness, conflict, and cynicism. Well, he might have been speaking about Nigeria, where the mood out there appears to be turning ugly, and the politics is about meanness, division, conflict, and tribalism. That's the path the country seems to be treading as the 2023 presidential election approaches amid lots of insecurity, particularly in the north and the southeast, and lots of veiled ethnic threats and rivalries and fierce competition amongst the regions over who's going to get to wear the coveted presidential crown in 2023. But whatever happened to the other crucial path to nation building, where Nigerians pull together to solve big problems and rebuild Nigerian society in a way that gives more people a better life and much more cause for hope? Well, Professor Chidi Odinkalu, former chairman of Nigeria's National Human Rights Commission and currently senior team manager for the Africa program of the Open Justice Initiative, is still with me in the studio. Thank you very much indeed for joining us Thanks or staying so with us me. um with all your experience with human rights issues and as a lawyer as well perhaps you should be focusing on conflict resolution in nigeria um conflict resolution how do you resolve conflicts when everyone comes to the table with a sense of ingrained injustice exclusion and unfairness uh, and um you know, it was the way. Well, isn't it to get people to talk and start to understand the different levels of that sense of injustice? You know, Peter Tosh said, um, I don't want no peace. I need equal rights and justice. When people don't believe, you know, everyone is talking about peace, peace, no one is talking about justice. When everyone is focused on peace, and the peace you're preaching is the peace of the graveyard. I think that's a mistake. 
And I don't think Nigerians want the peace of the graveyard. Nigerians mm. want coexistence. A and, you know, um, I, I went walking over the weekend somewhere. And in a small settlement of less than one square kilometer, I heard, I saw, and listened to people speak Fufu Day, Igbo, Yoruba, Egun, um, what do you call it, uh, from, um, from uh, Igbira. Yes? I heard, uh, I heard people from the plateau. This was just a piece. And, and I remember asking one of my colleagues with whom I was tracking, I said, just imagine if everybody here were to wield a machete, who would be left? Nigerians have coexisted for a very long time. Emeka Anyoko's wife, Emeka Anyoko is from Obosi. His wife is an Egba woman, right? IBM Haruna was GOC, second division in the Civil War, who lived in your father's, when they acquired your father's house in Enugu, the late Justice Anthony Anagolo, they were the people who acquired it, right? They requisitioned your, the house in which you grew up, Charles. Now, he is married to an Igbo woman, right? Ibrahim Babangida's wife is from Asa, or was from Asaba. We have married across. Philip Asiodu's wife is a Yoruba woman. And I could go on. Atido Peter's side, who I see here, from the Delta, his wife is, is Yoruba. We have so intermarried, we are so bound up together that to see the kind of leadership that some of these people are offering today destroys everything that any of us would like to see in the country. And th this is the problem. Now, so tomorrow, what are we going to have? My children will come from my village, go to school in the next village, go to university in my village, do youth service, if it continues, in the next village. And then from there, they migrate to Abuja to want to become Senate president or House of Reps speaker or chairperson of committee or head of a parastatal. What do they know about the country? So the orientation is simply not there it's to be Nigerian. Absolutely. Yeah. We're destroying the possibility of constructing a Nigerian space, geopolitical space that will work for everybody. That, that's a brilliant analysis. And by way of introduction, we described you as your... your um, career, I mean, you having an academic career and the fact that you're a lawyer, human rights activist as well, just to move away from that analysis and get to understand who you are better, which one takes up more of your time as a rule? I mean, or does it depend on the time and place? As someone said, there are times that raise questions and times that raise answers. Absolutely, yes. I, I, it actually, now is the time to think. Uh, you know, I, I'm spending most of my time now as a teacher um, and thinker, really, trying to grapple with a lot of these issues. Mm. Uh, because uh, we are not just at a difficult time for Nigeria. It's a difficult time for Africa. Uh, so I've been engaged, for instance, significantly with the issues in Ethiopia, Tigray and Ethiopia, the conflict there. But next door, Sudan has just overthrown its transition today, declared an emergency. Absolutely. And you have, now, these are two of the biggest countries in Africa. You've got Nigeria in crisis. In Tunisia, President uh, Said has overthrown the constitution. You've got Guinea. You've got Mali. So across the continent, there is a slide mm. across the board that endangers the African and the African geopolitical space. I'm not begin I've not mentioned the crisis in the Sahel. You know, Burkina Faso. The government of Burkina Faso is down to less than 20% of the country. Just outside, if you go outside Waga, you're in trouble. Um, you know, Greater Waga, you're mm. in big trouble. The government of Mali is in trouble. Outside Bamako and one other city, the, much of the country is in the control of people who don't wish the country well. So we are in a very difficult place as Africans. Uh, and that really, uh, and the African identity and its endangerment at this particular time when global multilateralism is in crisis is one that engages a lot of thinking. That's very interesting. Um, but given that Nigerians, myself included, can be spectacularly insular, um, I wonder if at the moment a lot of your time is taken up by thinking about Nigeria and democracy with all the things that are going on in the country right now. 
I won't say a lot of my time, but, 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 but because what I, try, I want to try to do is find where we can get inspiration from our neighbors, from other mm. African countries, to enable us forge a direction. That's really my preoccupation at the moment. So yes, Nigeria continues to be, and we'll always, you know, I'm a child of the Civil War. Uh, and to be perfectly honest with you, I cannot, you know, I, my, my earliest moments as a child were seeing children I grew up with played in the neighborhood with drop dead from malnutrition. And that has never left me. And sitting down here and imagining people unable to get anything to subsist on because their own people are either killing them or telling them that the path to liberation lies in sitting home and doing nothing and hoping that other people are going to drop dead breaks my heart. Mm. Uh, and the idea that when you try to engage in sensible debate, people say you're a saboteur and therefore you've got to be castrated or beheaded and your, you know, your decapitated head put up on the slab in the marketplace is something we've got to be able to pick up the courage to denounce. So we've got about a minute to go. Um, you've come back from the southeast. Where do you think things ought to go from here? There. What's the best way, based on your experience of all these conflicts and crises that are happening across the continent? We need a different kind of political leadership. And we cannot, by the way, and I've got to say this on record, we cannot continue to have the Supreme Court of all people make the man who lost an election or came forth in an election for governorship, something as serious as that, put him first. This must be the last time it is done. Because at the end of the day, Part of the crisis in the Southeast is that a governor in Imo state lacks legitimacy. Professor Chidi Odinkalu, absolutely delighted to have had you here. Thank you very much. Thanks indeed. for having me.